Oh yes, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back into Snow the Goalie. We have a we have a heck of a show. I'm just gonna I'm gonna tell you right away. It's one of the first times that I can remember in recent history that the three of us have sat down together and talked over the show before we've we've actually done a dive into it. A lot of times, like going off the cuff is just our thing. But there are so many things happening right now, uh, both in front of the camera, behind the camera, uh, on ice, off ice, that we wanted to make sure that as we dive into this, we have everything, all the ducks in a row, because uh, there is a lot going on and we need to get into it today. It doesn't matter that the Flyers are in something of a uh, unlovable season, uh, an underwhelming season. It doesn't matter. We are going to bring positivity today. A little bit later on in the show, we're going to have Bundy's Best, which is something I threw at him about uh, five minutes before we started recording. New segment on the show, Bundy's Best. So, uh, Bundy, if you've forgotten, now you've, you've got a couple of minutes to think of it over. Can that go for and, either, uh, either What's that? A Bundy's best is at Flyers only or any club? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a good question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe a little bit of time to look for some stuff, man. For us. There, there you go. So uh, we we do have a lot to get into. Uh, some continued, uh, maybe public sniping, some shots across the bow between John Tortorella and uh, Chuck Fletcher. Of course, what's going on with the team? Before we get into it, let me make the introductions here. First of all. My dear friend, Anthony Sanfilippo, find him on Twitter, at Philly. How are you doing, pal? And, and are you excited for some more Flyers hockey this week? Well, of course. I'm always excited for Flyers hockey. Uh, Vegas Golden Knights, the next opponent. Boy, that ought to be a, a, a treat to see how they play against that team, who's a puck possession machine. <laughs> so so ought to be a real treat out in, out in uh, Las Vegas. Um, but you know what? I, I was down at all five games for the homestand, and, and that's – Usually you don't get a five game home. That's a long home stand in hockey, right? And so it was like I felt like I was down there every other night, every you know, and just being being down there. And so, but I got to talk to a lot of people. So that was some good positivity to get some real uh, information about to where things are with this team and where it's going. Uh, but at the same time, I, I'm also a little bit relieved that I'll be watching a few games from my couch. You hear it here, folks. The man gets paid to cover the team, and he's more excited to sit on his couch. Hey, did you mount that TV yet? Did I? Uh... Did anybody uh, call out to Antony after uh, last I year? Got, very I got no DMs. I was disappointed. I got wow. zero DM. I got a couple people who tweeted me, tweeted at me like publicly about it. Nobody who really, really offered. One guy said, uh, I'm sure you got offers, you know, and he sent like all these um, links to all these mounts and things. And he's like, you know, I would come do it for you if you need me. But I, but I didn't ever, never got back to that guy. That was it. But I was a little disappointed that no one offered to come get a nice italian meal and mount a couple televisions so it didn't matter in a shock in an absolute shock people don't want to mount tvs at your house in delco for free all right and now <laughs> the uh the other man remember there a meal there was a meal oh, attached to it <laughs> holiday uh holiday shopping as it's going on road to redemption a great book a man who was on with preston and steve in studio earlier this week that's our very own chris terrian bundy find him on twitter at cterrian6 how are you you beaut I'm doing good, guys. Good to be uh, with you. You know, as I said, I, I kind of lightheartedly joked on Twitter last week that I only start brought like following hockey around the game, like <laughs> 20 mark, 22. And I want to take that from 82 to make it a 60 game season. And I think most players in the league would like like that, too. The owners will never let that happen. But um, doing good. You know, I'm impressive. Uh, really a strange week. Right. Anthony and Russ, like in a sense, like the Flyers end up beating in Colorado. Uh, Nathan McKinnon went out of the game. It's funny. It's even as fragile, a team that won a Stanley Cup, right? They lose their leader late in the first period, and they disappeared the rest of the game. It's incredible. It could happen to a team as solid as the Colorado Avalanche, too. They made it interesting. Uh, but the one, this is where it kind of shows you a little bit of who the Flyers are. They're they're at a Jekyll and Hyde type of stage, and I don't. there's not that much Jekyll, and there's a lot more Hyde. Um, but the Washington game is is a great example of Jekyll and Hyde. That's a game where you know the Capitals have had five on a road, uh, five uh, away on the road. Their finishing game is the sixth game on the road in Philadelphia, and they come in here and walk out with a four-one win, which is unacceptable, right? The Flyers should have just put them like physically abused them in the first period. Even Ovechkin, who gets two goals, right? We'll never know in two weeks how he got the two goals. We know how he got them; they were empty netters. He was invisible the whole game. He never even wanted to play. He was like, ah, oh, whatever. It's the last game. It's Philadelphia. They're, you know, they're not, not a good team by their standards. They've had success against them in the past. 
And he walks out with two empty net cookies uh, and looked pretty much disinterested the whole hockey game. But that's a game like that, guys, where good teams will put another team that's mediocre away. And the Flyers were unable to do that in, in a game like that. So that's the challenge that this team has. And quite frankly, I think where we're going to go today is, is a lot of John Tortorella's frustrations. And I think a lot of it, even as a hockey guy, it's been involved in thousands of games at multiple levels. Um, I can understand it. The Flyers just flat out, guys, when the game gets deep and rich, uh, have a really, really hard time um, executing skill plays to give them a chance to, to stay in a game or take a lead late in the game. And that's why that they are what they are. And that's why it's probably, you know, you hope that they fight wins out, but it's going to be, it's going to be tough, right? In the long haul. And we knew that we, we laid this out in the summer. This is not news. It is what it is, but what is news is the frustration level of the head coach. And, and it's become pretty, pretty evident now that from what I'm seeing and the things that he's saying and the things that you've reported, Anthony, you're our main guy down there. Uh, he's ticked off with the GM. And quite frankly, I think he's ticked off with the way the whole process has gone now that he's had a chance to kind of stick his head into the hole and have a look at the whole picture. I think he realized that this picture is really, really ugly. And he's already got a 10 game losing st uh, streak stuck on his record over the years has been tremendous. So, you know, it, it's frustrating in many senses, frustrating for the players. Uh, but I think that this is about to kind of hit where the rubber is starting to hit the road a little bit right now. And I think changes are probably going to ensue pretty quickly. That would be my guess, guys. I thought something might have happened early December, but I get a sense from talking to you guys and other people as well that it may, there may be something that transpires post the World Junior Tournament or early January. That's just my guess. I don't have any evidence of that, but something's got to give. Team has to do something for their fans. And I'll leave and it. I thought, so you're usually Russ, usually, usually that's where you like jump in with your like own little monologue that you well, want no, to present. You, you, but I'm, but I'm, like, I'm, were, I'm happy that you're throwing it this back is, to me. I'm this happy. is why so many people I think have now, I, I, I will say like, you know, you know, you know how I am. I like to like to toot our horn when we, when we can, yeah. but our, our numbers were up last week, especially on YouTube. They were, they were up on the podcast feed, but for some reason, I don't know if it's just because people are looking for Holly Jolly spirit and for, the glowing faces and the smiles and everything, but like a lot of people tune in. So those who are watching on the Crossing Broad YouTube channel probably saw it. Like, and it, it really looked like you were about to like jump in there. And so I, I that, wanted to, but I but I've I've learned nothing. nothing I've learned. <laughs> I've learned to wait for you. No, <laughs> and, what I was going to say was, um, and Buddy's absolutely right with the whole Jekyll and Hyde thing. The, since we've last uh, put out an episode, there have been three games. Yeah. You look at the game against New Jersey last Saturday was perhaps the best game that the Flyers have played all season. And they lost. And that's why they were so frustrated after the game. That's why Tortorella walked off blaming the media for asking dumb questions. I mean, it was their best game of hockey as a team. They took it to the first place Devils and should have won the game but didn't because they don't have the people who can finish. Then they follow up, beat Colorado. And look, it's a good win. McKinnon goes out. He was he ends up being their tenth player, tenth starter, not in the lineup, as it ends up being in that game. But coming into the game, you say, "Well, the Colorado's down nine players." You're right, but coming in, they had McKinnon and Rantanen and Makar, so they still had three superstars that are significantly better than anyone on the Flyers roster. So you had to assume, even with a lack of depth. In the, on that roster, that team was still a heavy favorite coming in. And the Flyers, well, Carter Hart played well enough mm -hmm. to steal a game for them because they were just – Flyers were – some. they were good at times and bad at times in that game. It was it was a little bit of both. And then the Washington game, as Bundy said, the, the Capitals were dead when they got here. First period, they had – I believe it was two hits they got credited with. Two. Flyers had 13. Like, that was a game that was – it was – the, the Capitals had no interest in, in being in that building. And the Flyers couldn't get a lead after two periods where they should have been the – they had – they killed – they took stupid penalties, but they killed them all off. Hart was playing really well. They scored another power play goal, which all of a sudden the power play is scoring, four goals in three games. Mm -hmm. But at five on five, they generate no offense. It's terrible. It's the worst offense in hockey. And then in the third period, Washington gets, a, you know, a tip goal. 
and then you're chasing to try and tie it, and they get a couple of empty netters, and it ends. And it's a game that you cannot let get away from you. You know and what, Can I say one thing? And Just adding yeah. up to that goal, though. Okay. So that's a, the richest part of the hockey game was that moment you talked about. The stick, the, the tip uh, yeah. that was about waist, a little more than waist high, went between yeah. hearts pads. Go back. So I, I went back three times to the beginning of that sequence, right? Mm -hmm. Nine and six could not get the puck stopped. They could not. Okay, they could not get the puck stopped on a fresh shift. They went soft into the corner twice, beat each end. And then the puck goes back, and then they take a like a soft shot that a guy is able to get position on into the middle yeah. and put the puck down. Yeah. That the, is the part where a coach will go back and watch a game and lose his marbles, because I did. Okay, yeah. they're, they're your veteran guys that are making that kind of money. That, that's the deepest, richest part of the hockey game. Get your head into it. Get your and, head and, into the game. And Torts has it's, been you got saying $15 this. $15 million or something on two defensemen, or $13 million. Get the job done and give your team a chance. And then they and both walk off with their heads down after. Pick it up. That's what you yeah. get paid for. So and do Torts your job. Saying yeah, this. That, that part bothered me to, to no end watching that he, sequence. And I watched it three times. And it started back deep in the defensive zone, missed coverages, soft plays. And that was the result of that's why the Flyers lost that game. Yeah, you're and right. Of, and and, and that's Torts, go for well Torts, of Torts, all people, Torts right? has been saying this. He has been saying he's been saying it's not the young players that are making the mistakes. It's the veterans. Mm -hmm. And he's not called guys out by name specifically, but you know you watch the play, you see what happens, and you're hundred percent right. It's Provorov and Sanheim on that goal, and that's the difference. And that's what he said. He said he called it a turnover that by a veteran. That makes the that makes the uh, leads to the second goal, and I'm not certain it was an it was an exact turnover, but it's exact. It's what you said, it was soft play where they couldn't yeah. get the puck, couldn't get it out of their own end. I I'm I'm almost afraid of what the answer to this is going to be, but I'll ask it anyway. Is there a chance that all of the upheaval, all of the the bad losing streaks, all of the underwhelming play all of the bad habits that have formed over the last few seasons are starting to come to the surface that like the reason that you're not seeing the younger guys making the plays but it's some of these veterans like Provorov Sanheim especially on that play have they had it instilled in them at this point so many bad habits and so many moments of I don't know if I want to say like games that haven't mattered as much or about, you know, uh, the turnover in coaching that's happened in their careers, especially in the last few years, it, it, are we just starting to see the cumulative effect of a lack of consistency and the lack of meaningful games being played? Like, is that what this is? Or is it just guys just aren't, for whatever reason, like they're, they're just kind of lost in what's already a bad season and, and they're just not going going 100%. Like, where, where are you at let, on this point? Let me discuss this. Let me touch on it first, Anthony, and jump in with me here. Yeah. I think those if you're going to go to those two guys right there, like Ristolainen, we know who Ristolainen is, right? He's a guy that, you know, was going to defend as hard as he can in his own limited offensively, limited pass-making abilities. Um, but the two guys with your uh, six and nine, and, he, and and so and even D'Angelo, we know who D'Angelo is. He's a power play guy, moves the puck pretty well. Uh, not a dynamo with a stick or a physical presence in the corners. This is the problem I have with six and nine. I don't think anybody, including themselves, knows who they are. Are they offensive? Or are they defensive? Provorov to me could be a little bit of a blend, but I think they forced him onto the power play over the years where I don't think he belongs on a top power play. And the same thing goes for Sanheim. He's a good skater, but I don't know if he defends good enough in the zone regularly to say he's a better defender than he is offensively. So I think a little bit of them is figuring out who they are. I think that happens with any defenseman that comes in and has to play top four minutes. You know, my first, and I say it's my first two years, I, you know, I came in as a guy who had a lot of points in college and in high school, and I realized pretty quick, that I wasn't going to be, uh, you know, point of every other game or a point of game, not even close. So what did I do? I knew that for me to stay and play, I had to be better defensively and a rock hound defensively. And that's how I ended up playing as long as I did, because I figured out after my third year, when I got benched by Terry Murray, that I was going to be a good, solid, big skating defenseman. And I think that Provorov and Sanheim need direction in terms of somebody telling them at a point, it's a point now saying, this is who you are. Whether you think you're somebody else, you're not. Like if, if Provorov keeps getting told he's Bobby Orr, he might keep believing it. 
maybe somebody needs to say you're not Bobby Orr, but you can be this guy who's a really, really good player. So I'd like to see him sharpen his tools, be a much better sound defensive guy, both of them. And then if there is an offensive flair for that, then let them try that. But I, I'm I, Anthony, I'm so convinced of this. These guys, these two guys I, I'm, are in their own minds battling to find out who they are as hockey players as much as perhaps a coaching staff is wondering aloud as well. I think you're there- I think I think you're spot on. I really do. And I've really kind of felt that way this year listening to Torts talk about Sanheim. Mm-hmm. He doesn't really say it much about Provorov, but I agree with you, Bundy. I think I think you're right on that. Um, but you hear him talk about Sanheim and He's he look, Sandheim's been putting up points in recent games, scored, scoring some goals, got some assists. I think he's at uh, eight points in the last eight games or something along those lines. Um, and then you ask Schwartz about it, and he says, Yeah, he's doing well at, at times. At times, like it, so, when mm-hmm. you hear that, it's like, it, and then he keeps saying, We still have to figure out, I have to figure out who these people, who these players are. I still haven't figured out who they are. I think that you're spot on with this is that they're offering up different versions of themselves from Mm -hmm. game to game and you're not seeing the consistency that you need in in any capacity so it's not like okay so maybe this game Sandheim's playing well offensively but then he's killing you in the defensive end or maybe this game Provorov plays really well in his own end but he's a mess on on the power play because he can't get the puck in at the blue line or whatever And, and it frustrates you because he's thinking one way in one game and not the full game or not being who he is. And I think that that's what's killed, what's bothering Torts more than anything else. Yeah. How much of this is ego? Like, I, like I, I'll pull back the curtain just a little bit. There have been players, and there have been people around this organization, some who are still with the team and some who are not, who have expressed uh, off the record some concerns about Ivan Provorov and his, his self-identity, his, like, self-worth. And maybe that because he's been put in so many positions in the past to be a power play quarterback, not a good one, but to, to be in that role uh, and to be leaned on so heavily in terms of the amount of minutes and, and the situations he's been deployed in that perhaps he has an overinflated self-worth is an ego. Like, is, is ego part of this? Is that why you see some of these mistakes and, and maybe a, uh, an inconsistency, at least on his part. I think that's a way of asking Russ: Is a player coachable or uncoachable? Right. I mean, it's, it's, it, right. Is that kind of where you're going with that? Um, maybe he's not. Maybe he's not quote unquote coachable. But maybe he's good enough at what he does that you let it go. And maybe that's what the fl- and that's what the Flyers have done with him so far. And we've seen a steady. Well, we've seen a, a fluctuation in his game, but from where he was when he first broke into the league and we the expectations that were put on him to where he is now, which is better than he was last year, but certainly not back to where he he he's expected to be. Um, I, I think maybe that's a thing. Maybe you just settle. They are just settling for what he is because he's talented enough to give you so much, but he's not going to ever go beyond that because just he's it doesn't get through to him. Maybe that's what you're. Maybe that's what you're saying, Ross. You have any kids that play hockey? No, I don't. So here's another theory, and I, I've been talking about this with this guy for a couple of years now, just kind of thinking about it. You know, we used to hear guys like remember Brian Elliott or other guys said, you know, Provorov, he's like a machine. He's like a robot out there. Remember early in his career? Yeah. You just you put him out, he's a machine, and he goes about it. You know what's funny? I look back at his hockey journey and a lot of other guys, right? When they get 26, 27. How much hockey did that kid play from 10 years old until 18 when he got drafted? I'm telling you guys, there's a burnout that comes into some play in this, and and I'm and people are noticing it more and more. These kids, the skill level gets higher, but at what cost? Because you've had a kid living in the rink from the age of 10 or 8 till 18, and there's some nights when I watch him, and I like to just watch players. And Tim Saunders used to say, I'd see, I I could tell when the Flyers used to come out the tunnel. It, what kind of a game they were going to have by the first lap around in warmups. And Tim or Timmy say, yeah, that is unbelievable. Cause he'd be, what do you think tonight? But I go, oh, it's going to be a good game tonight. They got some good juice and he'd be like the 30, 30 seconds, but I've watched him some nights. And the other thing too, with hockey players, I don't see a real happy hockey player out there. Like, you know, you want to have fun, make it fun. I mean, it looks like it's the hardest job in the world. I mean, yeah, 
it is hard. You don't want to get scored on if you're defensive. You want to win your corner battles. Be hard in front of the net. Clear the puck. Make a good first pass. But have fun doing it. I mean, that, and that's the part I see well, coming back. Like, nobody smiles. Nobody laughs. It looks like it's the most miserable fucking job ever. And it's not <laughs> supposed to be. Well, let me ask well, you this. Well, hold on, Russ. This is yeah. this is really good because this ties into something that Torts was talking about. And we kind of made light about this on Crossing Broad. But nevertheless, maybe it, maybe this kind of fits what you're saying. Is that you know Schwartz is not not a fan of the morning skate, and he says guys just need I don't want them I want them to get the hell out of the rink, like stop being around there. He says it's not about the physical plays that like, we're not doing anything in practice that's going to hurt them or slow them down at night. He said it's just more that you're here too much, you're doing too much. Take time for yourself. Go home. You know, watch watch something on TV, take a nap, whatever you got to do. He says we get so caught, players get so caught up in their routines and their regimen that it's when you get taken out of it for any in any way, it could really bother you. And then he said also it could be a strain mentally. And that's really kind of a thing. You haven't heard a coach say that in a long time. And I'm thinking, does this kind of equate to what you're saying? It's almost like don't you don't have to be a rink rat that much. You just kind of, you got there. Now just take it easy a little bit. Like me, when I tell people I quit hockey at 14 for a year, and the parents now, they go, no, you didn't. I go, I did. I didn't <laughs> play from 14 to 15. They're like, that's impossible. Because their attitude in their head is that they're dragging their kid. That's why I asked you, Russ, about you if you have kids in hockey. Because yeah. they're dragging their kid to a hockey rink for six hours a day that I know is not helping them. Yeah. Exactly. It's only, yeah. only going to tire the kid out. And, and to be honest with you, it's like, it's like programming a computer. But after you program it, you got to let the stuff settle into the computer. It's the same thing with a hockey player. You keep bringing them back to the rink, the rink, the rink. Nothing gets processed in his head. And that's honest to God, there's so many guys, there's so many like hockey players now. They've added that many more jobs. You're not, you can't, you're not going to tell me you got better league adding that many more players. You got more players and more teams, but it's diluted. And I'm, but I, again, these are parents like I, and I know them in South Jersey. They drive their kids to the rinks all day long. And, and that's reason. the thing though. It's, it's not just hockey, though. It's it's, it's everything. It's, most, it's yeah. most sports. Like you, you hear this Hockey's in basketball. With with a, right? you you hear the, the this in basketball with, with like AAU. Uh, I'll tell you, like back in back in my middle school soccer coaching days, you would have the kids who had just found the game that like didn't know how to put on their shin guards, but they were the happiest kids to like learn how to play the game. Yeah. Versus the the kids who had been playing on quote unquote elite club teams from the time they were like eight years old. And like you're looking at uh, what, like a 12 year old kid, 13 year old kid, and the pressure that they're putting on themselves to perform in like what is essentially a meaningless like middle school soccer game, they're they like have a hard time finding the fun there because they know that when that practice is over, their parents are going to take them 45 minutes away to a club team that is honestly garbage, but their parents are paying for it, being told that it's like a premier elite team. You know, we drove in 45 minutes to go and and uh, like have dinner in the car to go yeah. off and play an, in an, like do another practice for two hours. They're going to come home at like eight, eight thirty. They're going to do their homework and then they're going to crash. And that's and, and they do that's that. Okay. And, and the worst part is it happens year round. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, hockey is a unique thing, right? Because it's indoors. It's ice like that is what it is like. It's, it's there all the time. Soccer, a little bit different because uh, field to field availability. You have the indoor game and everything. But like then you see these parents who are doing these wraparound leagues where you're you're encouraged and almost um, shamed in a sense that like, well, why aren't you having your kid play travel? Why aren't you having your kid play at this this other club? Why aren't you having them do in case of soccer like futsal? Why don't you have them doing these other things? Their, their skills are going to drop off. It's like, hold the phone. The best players of generations before this one not only didn't do that. They also played other sports. Yeah. And and there there is a legitimate concern. And I don't mean to get this whole off track, but like there's a legitimate concern that if you aren't a well-rounded athlete, that if all you do is the same game, the same sport year round, you're putting wear and tear on the same muscle groups. And and you're you're potentially causing issues like with with uh like a healthy growth and everything, right? Like as as you're maturing, like there are so many damaging impacts. So all this is to kind of come back to Bundy's point. If there's if there's a guy who's been playing or, you know, girl in, in whatever sport who's been playing X number of years has been kind of like held to this idea that like you must be at the rink all the time 
proving your worth, proving your value, proving your commitment, by the time you're 26, you you really could be burnout. Yes. And maybe that is how it manifests itself. I will say I I don't blame a player with a new coach in town who goes above and beyond to try to prove himself. Like in, in the case of Tortorella, we talked about this at the beginning of the year. Some guys were going to be afraid of Tortorella and afraid of upsetting him or afraid of starting off on the wrong foot because there are stories from out from throughout the league of like, you don't want to piss off Tortorella. Don't get on his bad side. You you want to impress him. Maybe that's what this is. But there, there are just so many issues that continue to just pop up year in and year out. And in the case of like Provorov and Sanheim, like they're both on on pretty lucrative deals, respective, you know, to to what their performance had been to that point of their career when they signed on the dotted line. And it's frustrating because they aren't getting better. And you do have to have the the discussion at some point of like, are these guys as good as they're ever going to be? Because if they are, Sanheim is probably a number three defenseman. Probably like I, I would say he's a solid second pair defenseman, but I could make the argument just as easily that Ivan Provorov is. Uh, a low end top pair, but maybe even a a second pair defenseman on oh, yeah. a very good team. And if For that's sure. the case, and you have that much money committed and that much term committed to these players, like the question then I guess comes back around to like the construction of the roster and and giving these kind of contracts at this AAV with this term to players that do not raise your ceiling to a meaningful level. Yeah, and it's interesting. And I don't want to sound like the old guy, but I'm gonna I'm gonna just throw just math out at you real quick. So when Bundy and I were growing up watching hockey in the 80s, <laughs> gonna, I'll take you in back. The 30, 80s. It was the, the 80s. It was the 90s, Anthony. The 90s. <laughs> <laughs> it's 30, 35 years. 35 years ago. Let's go back 35 years. 1987, when the Flyers went to the Stanley Cup Final against uh, Edmonton, there were 21 teams in the NHL. Yeah. So if you had players. Doing the what Bundy's talking about, and it would, and it wasn't the case back then. But if you did, let's just say you were year-round committed in the rink every day. Da da da. da. It, you were still you were getting the best of the best in the sport in the NHL, and mm-hmm. so those were the players who could handle that from a from a mental approach. Now there's 32 teams in the league. That's 220 more players <laughs> yes. in the NHL now than were in the league back then. That were in the minors. That that were all minor league players yes. and not even all AHL. I mean, they could have 220. That's a lot. I mean, that's you might even dipping down into, into what would be the equivalent of the ECHL now that are playing NHL yes. hockey. Correct. Right, so East Coast League guys make it right now, right, Anthony? Yeah, that's that what I'm never saying. Never happened 25 years ago. They that's wouldn't get upset. So it's so it's it's kind of a it's so what we have is is we have a mentality that is an old school mentality that's still with the game that doesn't work for players who aren't at a certain level, and the Flyers tend to be full of those players. <laughs> Right, I mean, it's not yeah. knocking them. They're NHL quality players. They're NHL players, but they're not. The question is, would they have been NHL players thirty years ago? And the answer for most of them is probably not. No, right? Yeah, that's what I always tell people. I actually made the league when there was twenty three teams. Now there's nine more. Yeah, like you know, so we can go back. I mean, it's it, seriously, but that's two hundred and twenty jobs that someone that we all had to beat out of 220 other jobs, right? For the time I came in, there was uh, Tampa and Ottawa were the new teams in the league. Yeah. Um, you know, when I, uh, in, in 93, I think, or 90, whatever it was, but you're right. You're right. But yeah. But I mean, listen, I mean, and again, we're not, we're not critiquing growth of the game, right? Like we oh, like it's, growth, it was actually it's jobs, but you, but you're going to get a certain product when you add 225 minor leaguers to your NHL product, that's what's going to happen. And so people and have to going- adapt and the players have to adapt to that level and the fans have to also understand with nine more teams, either you some nights you're going to get higher skill level, it looks higher. Like McDavid's could go through this. You know, put McDavid in a league with 21 players where they would have chopped him down in the middle of the ice every night. It would have been like Wayne Gretzky in a lot of ways. Right. But what I'm saying is you're going to be able to see him execute that skill where he can get five points a night in this league today. And then there's other nights where you won't see that kind of stuff because there isn't as much skill, which is what the Flyers are right now, which is what we've been talking about, right? That limited skill. But that's why one or two or three guys can make a huge difference offensively 
just to get that motor started. And you know what? I'll leave it to you, Anthony, with this. Not so much different than like Amico Ranton and and uh, La- and um, Landis Cog and McKinnon in Colorado. That's all they had for years, right? You know, and then finally they got pieces around it to build, but it took a long time. It took a long time. Well, we're we're talking about like the the diluted value and like the diluted talent pool, and mm-hmm. that leads you, especially if you're a bad team or if you're a team that is relying on fringe players to to go out and fill your lineup. You run into a situation where a team doesn't have the ability to to score goals or to generate chances. And that brings us to something that happened a a few nights ago. It happened after Wednesday night's game against the Capitals. John Tortorella uh, was asked by Anthony, by Charlie O'Connor of the athletic about their defensive play and perhaps about whether it might be time to um, maybe shy away from the defensive end as much and try to generate chances. And this is interesting. And, and this is what John Tortorella had to say. Uh, about that, you have to be just that much better defensively. Now, do you see that as well right now? That oh, I, I think we've made strides defensively. Yeah, I, I, I think that the structure part of the game and cutting down our chances, guys. When we were seven, whatever the hell we were, we were giving up twenty-five scoring chances a game. We're in, we're into the twelve, fourteen, thirteen chances a game. That part of the game's coming. But we just we we Kevin has a chance uh, to tie it up there. I think it hits the post. I haven't seen the replay. We just we can't aff- we, when we have those major chances, we need to score because we just don't generate a, a lot. Worry that asking them to be that much better defensively when you're only giving up 11 chances is maybe asking them too much. No, nope, not at all. Kind of piggybacking off that. You said in the past that, well, you know, offense generation, a lot of it is just talent. Some of it can be manufactured. Would you consider opening it up a little bit in terms of, you know, maybe telling them to to go more for the offense, even if it sacrifices the defense? Or does the defense matter more to you over the long term? No, you, you guys are missing the point. I think where you're going is we're trying to be too defensive. Not a chance. We, we don't hold them back offensively. We just don't make enough plays, plain and simple. So, guys, that that's not exactly the most damning statement, but it certainly doesn't help. And what it seems what it seems to do is follow John Tortorella's um, talking point and his public. I don't know if I want to say condemnation of of what this team was built as but it 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 appears as though he's not blaming his players for being unable to create those chances he's sort of alluding to the fact that like this is the best that this crew can do this assembled roster as i've been given it as the coach we have coached these guys up these guys are executing at their highest level in many situations and they just can't generate those chances aka this team isn't good enough. These players, this combination is not good enough. And like, no, that's exactly he, what he's saying, Russ. Yeah. That's yeah, exactly he, what he's saying. And I'll say, I'll, I'll take it one step further. And it's funny because, you know, we, we know that earlier this season, Torts and, and Kevin Hayes kind of had a little bit of a, you know, they weren't seeing eye to eye. Although I think Kevin's kind of come around to the way Torts is uh, deploying him now. Um, but if you read further into that same story, I got a quote from Kevin Hayes where I asked him about this very thing. And he basically says that the, he, uh, well, basically he comes out and says it. We don't have superstars on this team who are going to come in here and score two or three points a night. So we have to play a certain way. And then he says, you know, uh, you almost feel like you, I mean, I, the question was, do you feel like you have to be perfect defensively? And he said, yeah. But he also he also said later he said I don't want to throw it on my uh, on my teammates to say that they have to be perfect or else he says but some nights you feel like you have to be more more structurally sound than the opposition if you have a chance of winning and he basically said the same thing too they don't have the talent and the ability to to score goals they're the worst offense in hockey two point four one goals per game. And Hayes and Konechny have been a part of 38 of the 65 goals. 
So that's only 27 goals that have been scored by people not involved, and it didn't involve either one of those two players in 27 games. That's one goal a game by players not named Hayes and Connecting. That's, that's that's fascinating to me. Those guys should be up for the Hart Trophy this year. <laughs> <laughs> Most important to your team. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it, but it is. It, it only seems like the only names you ever see on the score sheet are Hayes and Connectney. Every Hayes and Connectney has gone through hell last year. He couldn't I'm put smart. up a good score. So this this brings us back around. And, and if there are people who are listening to the show right now who are like, these MFers are going to go at this again. It, it, for better or worse, it bears repeating. The GM of this team remains in place. The guy who built this team, who hired this coach or was told to, hired this coach, did the aggressive retool, then kind of bailed on it, never said it publicly. He came up. We recorded last week. We put a show out. It was December 1st. And we knew that Chuck Fletcher was going to meet with the media. We knew that John Chordero was going to meet with the media. But we said, you know, we, we want to get our show up. And then after we got done, Tortorella met with the media and Chuck Fletcher met with the media. And this leads us to the, I think, the, the most ridiculous kind of like dichotomy that exists between the way that these two talk to the media and put forward their vision of like what this is and what this will be over the next few years. And the, the comments that they each made stood in such stark contrast to one another that we have to highlight them. And there's something else that kind of comes back to a point that we made last week about, you know, what, what could happen if Chuck Fletcher moves on and maybe why haven't we seen something? I want to get to that in a second. But before we do, I want to get to John Tortorella's comments from last week. And again, this, this happened around the time that um, we were recording. So I, I want to throw this uh, and, and get his comments. And then we're going to read off Chuck Fletcher's comments because I don't think you could have an organization that has two figureheads who are more at odds, at least in the way they present this publicly, than what these two guys are and where they're at. So let's take a listen. This is, this is John Tortorella talking about what this team is and what this team needs to do, not just now, but in the future. Hasn't changed my thinking. Uh, I again, I know some other things were said out here before I came in here. It hasn't changed my thinking as far as what I think needs to be done here. And uh, uh, th this team needs to be built, and it needs to be built from uh, from the footers. We're not even in a foundation. We're in the footer position, as far as I'm concerned, just to uh, try to build the foundation the proper way. And, and to be clear, when uh, that yes. Yeah, yeah, it, 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 it is like I, I get people asking me how you doing and this and that and, you know, with uh, with the losing and stuff like that. I, I love the opportunity that we have here to to build something from really the ground up. And uh, um, that that's that when you when you have when you're feeling some pain and we're going to feel more pain, we're going to go through a lot of pain when you start feeling that pain, do you change your thinking and, and panic and, and, and readjust your, uh, how you're going to go about it? That's the important part for us in this organization is just stay with it. No matter how much pain you're going through, stay with it. Because when you get on the other side, that foundation is going to be strong. You're not going to be uh, knee jerk and back and forth. And that's the way I'm going about it. And for some reason, uh, uh, someone thinks different about it. I'm going to argue. Uh, because I think that's the best way to do it here, is, is to is to build it the proper way. Uh, you've spoken a lot about mistakes and like where your frustration is, but like maybe not necessarily the mistakes themselves, but the ones that just start to get repeated. Now I, I, I want to stop it there because I, I don't want to play the entire availability. There there's another quote that he gets to where he says this isn't a one year type of thing. We've got some work to do. It's going to take some time, no matter what uh, people want to hear. It's going to take time to get this thing right. I, I, I know that sometimes there are people who think that we're sensationalist about the way that we present things. But guys, remind me, remind me, when this happened in the summer, 
when this GM entered the summer with a new coach on the docket and they eventually hired John Tortorella, did we or did we not say there will come a moment where this man will call out the GM for putting together one of the worst rosters in the league? Did we say that? We have pretty much have actually laid out an entire roadmap of this season. And I'll be honest with you, I'm going to toot our horn because I usually don't, but I'm going to. We told people right after the draft and free agency exactly what this railroad track would look like right till the end of April or in the middle of April. It's going to be a nightmare. Tortorella said it. We already, guys, here's the issue we talked about. Anthony, we said it right away. Why, if you have a team with limited talent, why would you bring in a dynamo like John Tortorella? Here's the issue, right? John Tortorella just said he's got a four-year contract here. He'll never see a winning season. Highly unlikely that he's going to see a winning of any kind here over that point. You, when he said a rebuild, see, he's already at the 25-game mark, and he already said it's going past this year, right? Like it's going to take time, but we got a chance to build something, which is fun. My issue right now, though, with the team is – you know, when you have that, and he's he's angry about the 10-game losing streak because that went on, and that's on his watch, and that's when this stuff started to reverberate and come out in the media. So, yes, there's a process that's involved, but we told everybody this summer, if you're going to get a guy that's as qualified as a John Tortorella, and he is, he's the biggest free agency free agent they picked up in the summer, why would you have him lift the ability of your group that you know is already limited to begin with? You might as well have brought Mike Yo back in. And roll the dice because I don't think what anybody wants, nobody wants to see this team finish with the ninth worst record in the league when they had a chance to finish far worse than that. I don't want to see a team do bad on purpose, and I don't think it is. But this team, you don't have to do anything. It is what it is. I mean, this is with a guy like John Tortorella who's had successes everywhere. He's struggling to find wins with this team. And we've just laid out in the last 30 minutes why that is. It's a lack of skill. It's a lack of talent. It's a lack of development. It's a lack of acquisitions in free agency. It's a compilation, and that's what he's talking about, the footers. We're not even at a foundation. That's the head coach saying that. When you talk about footers, you're talking about getting guys in here that you're hoping you can keep around for a couple of years to try to build. There's guys that are going to come in here, are going to help elevate this team if it goes in the process, and they'll never be around to see the end result. They'll never be there. That's part, of, very much part of the process. Same thing with John Tortorella. He might be the guy that you look at in eight years and say, Man, we were really lucky to have had that guy for four years because it was him that helped build the foundation of where this team is eight years from now. And so that's that's really – but we've told everybody the whole time, straight up, no bullshit as advertised, we told you guys and we laid out exactly what this season would look like, even how the start would go. And me and Anthony, to the credit, we almost picked the exact record of what 20 games look like, and we gave the Flyers better credit than they probably deserve because why? because we said they're going to be scared or they're going to wonder what Tortorella's about and they're going to be forced to have a good start. And what happened? They had a good start. But then when things started settling and teams started actually taking them more seriously, well, then that's when things started to get a little bit ugly. So there's work. There's a lot of work ahead of them on every side. What I'd like to point out from that, something that's not been talked about, something that's not been written about, is what he said at the very beginning of the quote when he comes in and says, I know that some things might have been said in here beforehand. Mm -hmm. So here's what the here's what a lot of people don't know. Chuck's availability was supposed to be before Torts came off the ice that day. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when Torts gets in there, he thinks the media's already talked to Chuck. <laughs> so when he says that, that's what he's referring to. Because there, there was some confusion about this. Like, we weren't sure. Well, who the hell was he referring to talking about? But the schedule got changed that day. And Chuck ended up going after Tortorella. And, and they had, I guess they had not communicated that to the coach when mm -hmm. he said that, before he said that. And then Chuck ends up coming up afterwards. And I know Russ wants well, to get into what Chuck said. So, but that's, so, but, but it's evident that that's. He was referring to, to, to Chuck, and he was also referring to Chuck when he said, that's how I'm going about it, and if anybody wants to disagree, I'll argue it. The anybody that he's referring to is Chuck Fletcher. So we, we know this. Like, this is what's going on and, right. right now in that building. 
Is this where and, things were? Is this where things were really good with the Flyers when they were only five points out of the wild card spot? No, that's what well, we're getting to. Well, we're we're, we're right going to get there because right. well, that I, was beautiful. I love. It's like wow, we're twenty three games in, we're five points out of the wild card. Let's go, boys, giddy up! <laughs> so I want to go back to this really quick because here's here's the rest of what Tortorella had to say. Year uh, type of thing. We got we got some work to do, and it's going to take some time. No matter what people want to hear out here. It's going to take some time to get this right. If we want to get it right, it's going to take some time. So I guess when you do use like the analogy of foundations and the Warriors, you're talking about building, um, and they've been very shy about the word rebuild. So I guess how do you see that being the same or different? I'm not, I, I, I'm not a big language guy. I like building. I like using building words. I like seeing things built, and I, I am thrilled that I'm uh, right now I have the opportunity to help there. As far as language, you can call whatever the hell you want. I know how this coaching staff is going to go about it. And whatever word you want to use, uh, you can use. But I, I, I feel very strongly that it, you, can, you just get stuck in the mud if you continue to put Band-Aids on and, and gimmicks to get people in the building and uh, whatever it is you, you're trying to get people. You get people in the building and get it right by winning. And the only way you can win is building it the proper way. And that's how we're going to go about it. You know, I don't want to say that John Tortorella has been listening to Snow the Goalie. Yeah. I want to say that he, <laughs> but Sounds like us. how many times? And, and this is where, like, I don't know. Is, is it vindication, maybe? But, like, he's saying all the things that we've been saying for, I don't know, 12 months, 18 months longer, that you can't and, – and this is where we come back to something we talked about last week. The, the people in the, in the ticketing and marketing, those, those sectors of this business, of this organization, they have to do what they have to do, right? Like they, they've been given a, a very unfair hand because the team has been bad and has been poorly constructed and they're doing what they can. But when he talks about band-aids and gimmicks, all right, so gimmicks, we, we go to that, like, you know, gritty was the face of the franchise and like that, that's what you did for a while. And like, they haven't marketed these players well and all that. Okay, cool. The band-aids thing though, is I mean, he could. This is like that 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 old like Trump line about like you know I could go into the into whatever avenue and like shoot somebody in the street and it'd be whatever. John Tortorella could legitimately walk into Chuck Fletcher's office and take a dump on the floor, and it would probably be less offensive or impactful than what he did by saying that because band aids, baby. Chuck Fletcher works at CVS. All right, like that's what Chuck Fletcher does. He gives you all the band-aids. He gives you all the cheap fixes. He like John Tortorella took a dump on the on whatever the hell Chuck Fletcher thinks his legacy is going to be as the GM and president of this team. I mean, he pretty much just said this incompetent buffoon has built this team and remains with this team. But I'm going to tell you the truth, folks. It's going to take a bit of time, but don't worry. I and my coaches, we got this. I mean, how else can you interpret that? Even if you are one of these psychotic people on Twitter who say, you guys are trying to just draw a bunch of, you're trying to connect a bunch of dots that aren't there, okay? He hired, and again, I said, and there's there's somebody out there who has a bit of a platform who says, well, if Chuck Fletcher didn't want this coach, he wouldn't have this coach. All right, cool, cool. We can come back to that. But John Tortorella just said yet again, this ain't it, homie. This ain't it. This plan, this aggressive retool, this like selling the fan base on things, that ain't it. And the best part is what came next. Because as Anthony pointed out, it was supposed to go Fletcher, then Tortorella. But instead it went Tortorella, then Fletcher. And the best part of it all is Chuck Fletcher had the ability to watch what John Tortorella said. He's in the building. This was live streamed. He could have listened to the coach and gone off the coach. And instead, Chuck Fletcher went out and did arguably the worst job. And, and that is a low bar. Horrific job talking to the media. <laughs> Let's get to some Chuck Fletcher quotes because they are so this, detached from reality. Is this before or after the dump on the floor? <laughs> after. <laughs> <Is> after. After. <laughs> Chuck Fletcher meets by, the By media. the way, Russ, I think I think yeah. you need to, I think you need a new podcast called Stick to Impressions. <laughs> yeah. So, go ahead. I'm sorry. 
<laughs> I got it. I got it. I got yeah. it. <laughs> so the standout quote from Chuck Fletcher. I expect to be more competitive the rest of the way. We're five points out of a wild card spot. We'll see. Okay. Let that sink in. If you're a Flyers fan and you've been watching this happen, you've been watching these last few years, but you've watched the first 20 plus games of this season. You've seen what this team is. You've heard this coach talk after games. The GM comes out. The guy who built this team says, well, we're five points out of a wild card spot. <laughs> we'll see. This is almost as bad as when he came out. Was it last year and said, we are what we are. This guy, is so detached from the reality of what this is and is so hell-bent on trying to hang on to his job that he is in the ultimate spin cycle. Absurd. He said, I do expect us to continue to defend well, continue to compete, and to, uh, and to be a hard team to play against. I mean, our issue is scoring goals. Will Konechny and Van Riemsdyk and hopefully Atkinson help? They should. They were our three leading goal scorers last year, so they should help. Cool. Thanks, Chuck. You referred back to an aging veteran that nobody wanted to take in the offseason, James Van Riemsdyk, a player who has been MIA for whatever reason, Cam Atkinson, good guy, has been absent this season, Travis Konechny, who's in the midst of what looks to be a rebound season under this coach. And you cite those three players as being the leading goal scorers on last year's team, which was a fucking horrible team. A bad team. And your way to try to express optimism for what could happen is we're five points out of a wild card spot and the three guys who were like the least shitty of the shit heap last year are going to lead us to prominence. Or at least we'll see. And make it make sense. It doesn't make sense, Russ. That's exactly what I wrote. It's it's hysterical to me that, that Chuck would come out and do that. I, I Like, you're exactly right. He heard what his coach said. All he has to do, he doesn't have to necessarily come out and agree with John Tortorella, but he does. You don't go 180 and say, well, we're only five points out of the wild card. You basically say, yes, you know, we, you know, there's a lot that still has to get better with this team. We're working on it. Hopefully we'll get some improvement once we get some uh, more offensive players back into the lineup because of the injuries, but you don't bring up the wild card. You don't say you're going for the playoffs. You just don't go that route because the fans don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear the BS. And you're, again, you're, you're gaslighting your fan base. Yes. It's, in, it's insanity. It's yeah. absolute insanity. And, and, and what has, what has happened since then? They played four games, lost three of the four. And, and if Colorado was healthy, let's be honest. If they were a complete, fully healthy team, you probably lost all four. Yeah, if, if McKinnon but, finishes the game, because he looked like he was ready to play that night. Yeah. And it looked like it would have been that. But, I mean, uh, it's – and, again, I think the one thing that comes out of it, Russ, is and Anthony, too, is the fact they're just not on the same page at all. And Torch will not be on that page at all because it's not helping him. He is – he's been notorious. I don't know if people know this, but, you know, we've been around the league a long time. He's notoriously pushed hard on his general managers in the past. Far – far bigger names than Chuck Fletcher and, and guys that you could push push on. But Torts, his attitude is if I'm coaching a team and you're going to give me a bad product, then I'm going to push back on you for providing me that bad product. And I'm going to hold you accountable to get me better players here, however that is. And if you can't do it, then I'm going to support the next guy who comes in and does. And and that's interesting. And that's a really important note. And it, and it comes back to the fact that like it doesn't sound, and I, I could be wrong. You guys let me know if, if I'm off base here. When I hear John Tortorella's oh. comments, I don't hear him saying, Chuck, go make a trade. I don't hear Chuck, we're one piece away. He he specifically said, like, we're in the footer stage, which stands in, like, such, I guess, like, stark contrast to what you would expect him to say. It's not like he's a 30-year-old a coach. Like, there is a shelf life on, on how much time I would assume John Tortorella would want to remain behind a bench. And he's not in here preaching, like, sell off the young pieces for whatever they're worth and get me some vets in here to like win games and like compete for the eighth playoff spot. He's legitimately saying the only way to get better is to figure out what the foundation of the team is, which I mean, we know how this was over the summer. 
and and even before we talked about like do you do a full rebuild do you retool do you just try to you know make a, a few moves he certainly sounds like a guy who's saying if if nothing else we need to identify which young players are worth building around and maybe not tear it all the way down but like we we have to make that determination this season it it is absurd that chuck fletcher went out and publicly said what he did. It makes no sense. It sounds like a guy who's just trying to defend his existence and his role in the organization, which brings us to the guy that we talked about last week who makes the most sense for them to install as like the interim GM, and that's Danny Briere. Now, an interesting thing to note that came up in, in, in our conversation as well as uh, in the Flyers, um, uh, if you go on Twitter, on Twitter communities, we have the Snow the Goalie of Flyers pod uh, Twitter community, which is now over 300 members strong. It is the largest Twitter community for Philadelphia Flyers fans. If you're on Twitter, you can go over there. We'll uh, tweet out the link to that. We'll probably include it in the description of this episode. You can join, talk to your fellow Flyers fans. We said there are no screen caps in that group. If if you have a hot take or you have a question or a thought about the Flyers, you're not putting it out to the whole public. You can put it to our little Snow the Goalie family there in the Twitter community. Uh, somebody brought up, and I, I want to shout this person out, Patrick Mullen. At Fear of the Walrus, I love that handle, says, so Briere is on the management team for Team Canada at the Spengler Cup, which runs from the 26th to the 31st. I wonder if that has anything to do with the timeline that's been floated, which gives Chuck until the end of December at least. Guys, is there a chance that the reason that a move hasn't been made, or at least part of the reason, is because Briere is involved with Team Canada in some capacity, and that could lead to a move being made once he's back in the new year. I'll go first on this one, and I'll say yeah. Um, Danny, Danny's going to be at the at the that con, um, World Junior there, which runs actually. I think it goes through the fourth of January, if I'm not mistaken. If you look at the flyer schedule, they're on the road trip, the the annual post Christmas road trip. Um, through the beginning of January, and then they come home for a couple of games uh, around a weekend. Um, I I think that that either right before those two home games, or or in between those games, so like this maybe even Sunday the sixth. I think a lot will kind of depend on. I'll be honest, a lot will depend on what Eagles news is happening mm -hmm. on that Sunday. Like, well. That's I think that's the last game of the se of the regular season, if I'm not mistaken. If it is, then yeah. January first, I believe. Yeah. If that, so whatever that weekend is. So if the Eagles need to win and that's a big game or whatever, um, they probably won't do it that day. But if it's a meaningless game and we know the Eagles are going to be playing the backups and whatever, and you want to kind of steal some headlines, that could be the day that it happens. Um, I. I, I you know, I've talked to a lot of people in the organization. There's a lot of smoke. Um, and usually when there is something's the shoe's going to drop. The question is when, and I think there's that, a fire now, Anthony. It's yeah. Beyond, yeah. It's a little yeah. fire started already. Yeah. yeah. And I think that, I think it's just a matter and I'll tell you what their big debate is. And this is something that I don't want to drag this out here, Ross, because I know you'll, you'll freak the hell out when I say this, because this is, this is going to drive you. I know what you're going to say, Anthony. Go ahead. I'm, but it's going to yeah, drive. I never freak out. What if, but it's going to drive. Ever... The, it's going to drive fans insane too. Yeah. The debate that they're having and and why it's kind of taking so long is if you put Danny in as the GM, okay, fine. But is Chuck completely gone? <laughs> or or does he just lose his title as general manager, but remains president of the team? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I, don't, how, I, don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't know that stuff. You know that, Anthony. I don't. I don't even. That I sounds like insane, but whatever. I mean, if you did, if that was the case, I mean, listen. When Homer lost his job, and Hextall took over, lifetime Homer, flyer, lifetime flyer, though. Homer became well, yes, but I, but I think that there are, you know, obviously there are people pushing for Chuck to stay, including some of the um, some of the older guys, some of the um, some of the advisors like Clarky. And, you don't say. You know, um, and, I'm and, shocked. And I'm, I'm told, shocked. and I'm told Dave Scott really likes Chuck as a person. And so, therefore, maybe doesn't want to just say, pack your bags. But optically, 
don't you have to remove him? Like yeah. keeping him in the organization as president of hockey operation, if that's a debate, if that's something that's going on, don't you have to say this fan base will never buy it? They'll never go no. for it. No. Right? I mean, you have to, you have to, somebody has to get into Dave Scott's ear and say, I don't care what the advisors are telling you. I'll be, yeah, and I'll be honest with you. I'll say this myself. Like, if I were Briere and they, someone said, we're going to hire you, and I don't know how many people are above you. Yeah. I would go in there personally and I would look and talk to every single person in that office. But I'll say this, and I have friends in there. I think it's time to, I think it's time to clean house. If you're going to do the go that way, you clean the entire house. And yep. you bring a new house in because you're guys, this there's been a point to this entire discussion today. And a lot of it's come off of torts. And a lot of it is about the care and the future of this franchise because we've gotten there. We're already there. We're already in the thick last year. We were going into it and we knew it. Now we're in it. So what do you do? And how does it look? John Tortorella saying, I like to build. I want to help. I want to help be a process. Probably won't be here to win the cup or to be part of a long uh, uh, playoff run, but he wants to be a part of it. If you got a new GM coming in with a clean slate, and again, I'd like to talk to Danny after because I'd like to still want some more advice and input about the moves that were made last summer because they were garbage, like in a, in a long-term sense. Like not garbage, I don't say garbage, yeah. but there's guys that were signed to deals that you wouldn't get signed anywhere else. And I'd like to know yeah. what the game plan is here because rubber stamping Chuck's moves, I would not have tolerated. I would have said like, what are we doing here, guys? You got to have the balls in a room with a group of adults say, what are we doing? And how does this better my team? Put it on paper in front of me and show me. But to me, there has to be a complete overhaul. Um, that's the nature of running a franchise in a business like this. People lose their jobs. People come in. They try to make turns and, and things better. Um, but that's the way I would look at it from a very business-like uh, decision from Briere. And I think he's got to tell Dave Scott, hey, listen, I need to have free reign. If you want me to do this, I need to have free reign. I can't have three guys behind me. You need input. You need input for sure. But you don't need eight pieces of input. You don't need people around rubber stamping some move that may not really be. GMs make bad calls sometimes, right, Anthony? You've been around. They make yeah. we've seen it. They they like a guy that no one else does, and they make a mistake getting him. We need to make sure those mistakes are removed as you move I, forward. You can't make I field mistakes like that. We have cap problems coming that are going to remain with us for a, for a while. I don't want to get in. That's another episode. But that's where we're at for me today, guys. There was a, a concerted point with this conversation, and it was pretty dedicated to what the coach is now seeing after he's evaluated for 20, 25 games. We don't have the horses here to win a multitude of hockey games. We have to get better through the draft, through a good free agent signing, uh, you know, not depth guys on four-year contracts, even though I'm sure he's a great guy, Deloria. I know he is. Nothing to do with that. Um, but I'm just saying you have to be very, very calculated in how you sign guys and the money that you give out. You know, Risto Linen, who gave him that money? That's – I'm not making fun of Risto. Of Risto. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not – you know, I, I had my own deficiencies when I played. People probably shit on me too. But who decided giving him 5.5 was a good idea? And who's the voice over Chuck's ear saying, that's not a good move, dude. We don't want to make that move. You know, that's what I would have said. But Signing I Sandheim to an eight-year contract. Yeah. That's, and that's another move. You know, like another like, – why? So – I, I, I want to put this on the plate, and we can talk about it now, we can talk about it next week, we can talk about it in the months to come. Ch we, we, we mentioned last week, John Tortorella has gone on record and said that Danny Briere is this brilliant hockey mind. I, yeah. I question if it's sure. because he thinks that Danny will go along with whatever he says and, and will be kind of a yes man, but probably is a smart hockey mind, and like maybe that's what this. Sure. When, when, when the coaching search came up at the beginning of the summer, the thought with Barry Trotz was Trotz might want to coach for two or three years and then move into a front office role. Now that John Tortorella has seen what this team is, is there a path? Is there potential that John Tortorella is only the coach for a year or two and then moves into a front office role with this team with Danny Briere leading the way Danny Briere is the GM but John Tortorella moves into something more of like an advisor. I'm not saying the president of hockey ops. I'm just saying like some kind of a, of a special advisor to the GM, something like Tortorella decides that my, what I would really like to do is instill the values that this team needs in terms of playing on the ice, help start to build this. And if he determines this isn't going to happen anytime soon, and I, and I really don't want to be behind the bench for four years of losing, 
could he move into a role that helps in turning this thing around? And in a sense, kind of like in his hockey legacy, has these like great moments as a coach and then could maybe be part of the team that actually turns around the Philadelphia Flyers. Like that is a hell of a legacy thing to leave behind. Am I, am I ridiculous? It, is, is there a chance? Well, I don't think so. He's got the right team for it. That's for yeah. sure. <laughs> I don't, I don't think so, Russ. I mean, just real quick answer. I don't think that that's how he's wired. I think he's a coach and wants to coach and wants to teach. Um, I'm not convinced that – I mean, I think he will be here for the length of his contract. I think mm-hmm. he'll be here for all four years. Yeah. Um, and I think that what I think will be is as we're going into year four, if he feels like we can get there in a year or within the next year or two, maybe he gets one more crack at it and sticks around for years five and six. If after year four he's looking at it and like, this is still another four years, then I think that's when John – goes into retirement i helped build this hopefully someone else can take it home from here so i think i honestly think that that's what how, how he looks at it okay i just want to put it out there yeah you know and if it proves right. to be right i'll clip this this little bit of the audio and in like two years i'll come back to it and i'll put out a tweet about how i was right again you of know course. it'll be fine of course all right we got Hashtag two Rutgers. you got two uh five stars and then we got to re- get out of here that's yeah, exactly two. right buddy and i have places to be I'm yeah. at my home. I'm in my home in Canada right now, in Ottawa. My uh, my my house I was born and or grew up in. So I took okay. a ride up here the other day and uh, saw the folks and friends and family, and away we go. Let's go, First Russ. We find out that Wayne Fish has two houses, and now we've uh, we've got two house Bundy over there. <laughs> no, no, um, my, right. my mom and dad's house. Oh, okay. <laughs> There we go. So uh, we have a couple of five-star reviews. Remember, these are the things that uh, warm the cockles of Anthony's heart. The first one is from Puckhead Rich. Five stars. Snow the goalie couldn't be better. I never miss a podcast. It's so full listening for this old, long-time suffering fan. I'd give it six stars if I could. I thank you for all that you do. And then Darth McYoda says the best. (laughs) Best Flyers podcast, hands down. Russ is a little over the top. But Ant is a nice yang to that yang. I think he means yin to that yang, but that's okay. Adding Bundy was icing on the cake. Love his knowledgeable and passionate takes. Just wish he was on more consistently. Keep up the great work. Back-to-back weeks, we've got Bundy here. And I, I, I want to point out before we go, we did get some questions over in the Twitter community. I think we touched on all of them. We didn't we didn't do like the, the full reading of them on the, the show. But we'll send a, a thank you out to uh, Fly Guy Josh ninety one behaviorist uh, Hankin S N. Let's see who else. Uh, Tiara ten twenty three Jakey D forty nine uh, and SE one hundred one at. Uh, they asked questions about Briere uh, about is Briere a potential GM. We talked about that last week a little bit. This week um, questions about like how do you what do what do you sell this. Uh, this fan base on in terms of the future. We can get into some more of that uh, next week, but a lot of questions about Chuck, a lot of questions about like the, the, the way that, that things are kind of perceived. One guy uh, said that he just thinks the organization is effed and nobody has the foresight. So we'll get into this and remember, you know, every week we'll be here. Um, Bundy, is there something that stood out to you this week as being Bundy's best? Was there a player who stepped up? Was there uh, a, a young guy that caught your eye? Was there a, a moment in a game that caught your eye this week? Um, yeah, the goal against Colorado, they took the lead. Was that uh, Lazinski that scored that goal, the rebound? Nice pa- shot by Farabee, and then the rebound got a mm-hmm. stick on it. You know what? That's a play where it seems as easy as this. Pretty skilled play to get a stick on a puck like that off the rebound and, and, and beat the guys in the position. That's something you, that the Flyers will look to. You know, again, just it's it's not a big play, guys. It's nothing that's going to wow you. But it's simple hockey, and it's something that Torts is looking for vi- via scoring chances right now. So look for more of that. You know, just never know who those guys are going to be that he's going to like at the end of the year. But that was a nice play there by Lisinski. Uh, and I actually think all in all, I think Farabee's been a little bit better lately too, just kind of finding his game a little bit. So some positives as we move in. Carter Hart's been good, but mired in inconsistency by his defense in a lot of nights. Um, and penalties too. You can tell Torts. The one thing with John Tortorella, I know we're going to go, but 18 years watching him coach since Tampa, he never changes his look when the penalties call. Oh, <laughs> he looks it's the same every yeah. time. doesn't matter what it is. He looks like he wants to kill somebody, but 
you know what? I, I, I did. I like that play. And, 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 I, and I, that's kind of how the Flyers are going to have to execute this year, plays like that. So yeah, it, it feeds it perfectly to what we talked about. And Guys, have a good weekend. Great seeing you. Thanks for listening <laughs> and, and maybe even watching Snow the Goalie. Remember, you can find us wherever you get your podcasts. You can find us on uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, uh, Amazon Music, any place that there's a podcast, uh, you can find this show. You can also follow us over on Facebook, facebook.com slash snow the goalie. You can follow us on Twitter at snow the goalie, at Ant San Philly, at Joy on Broad, at C Terrian Six. All of those handles, by the way, are the same over on Instagram if you want to follow us there. I'm going to do a better job this week of clipping some stuff and putting it over there. We have been picking up a bunch of followers over there. Um, remember, the, the content that you'll find, uh, the coverage of the team, crossingbroad.com. Anthony will be writing up game stories and reactions to things. Uh, if you want to watch the show, youtube.com slash crossing broad. There's an entire playlist of all the Snow the Goalie episodes. You can go back in the archives, check out some of those uh, those prior episodes. I think there's a few interviews on there as well uh, with past coaches, players, uh, front office executives. You can go find that. So for Ant on Twitter, at Ant San Philly, for Bundy at C Terry and Six, I'm Russ at Joy on Broad. Thanks for listening, maybe even watching Snow the Goalie, the only Flyers podcast. We'll talk to you again next week.